Okay, thanks, David. Uh, this is going to be probably more history than mathematics. Uh, my, my interest in cryptology began about 15 years ago, and it's focused primarily on the relationship between mathematics and cryptology and the mathematicians who served as, as cryptologists. What I'm, what I'm going to be talking about is work that's still going on. I'm hoping to finish this by the end of the spring semester. What has happened with this, though, is it's been an opportunity for me to involve a number of students in doing uh, capstone projects. So a, a bunch of this is being worked on by students at the moment. Uh, the story is not the story begins really with World War I, where this was the first time that signals intelligence was significantly used in warfare. Signals intelligence people had to learn how to develop their techniques for code breaking, and then commanders had to learn to trust them and also how to use the information they received. So the story really begins in 1924, when at that time, Lieutenant Lauren Safford established a research desk at Naval Communications in DC. He was looking for developing some code breakers for the Navy. And his, his way of searching for them was that he put problems, code breaking problems, in the monthly newsletter. And people who solved the problems were encouraged to write to him. And he would get in communications with these people and try to develop a group of people he thought would be good code breakers. Now, over the years, that developed into a course in cryptanalysis. But more significantly, it developed into a correspondence course in cryptanalysis for the Navy. The correspondence course consisted of 12 lessons. They're very, very short, because of course they had to be mailed back and forth. And they're very, very elementary. Um, typically, what you would see is two or three pages which would describe some cipher systems. Yeah, this is about half of the first page of assignment three. And already, they introduced three different cipher systems here in which you're replacing letters by numbers. So. And after reading those two or three pages, then the student would be given three or four pages of problems with no clue as to how to solve them and just ask to solve things. Now, of course, you knew if you could solve them, because it would make sense when you got, got the other end. And students would take the course. And if they were successful, they, they would sort of keep track of where these people were, um, bring them in for training, and so forth. But as World War II broke out in Europe, the Navy decided that they needed a reserve of people who might be called upon to be code breakers during the war. They used their friends on college campuses to search out students and faculty who might be good code breakers. And in particular, they searched out mathematics faculty. When war broke, and they, they offered them the correspondence course, um, those who were successful then when war broke out were sort of recruited into the Navy. There's sort of going to be two sites that we're going to be talking about. One is in DC at Op 20 GM. GM was the research section where the mathematicians were employed. This is a group of Navy mathematicians. The waves, unfortunately, were just the clerks at the time. But the men were the Navy mathematicians who served during World War II as code breakers. They're posed outside the Naval Communications Annex up on Nebraska Avenue. That's now the uh, Department of Homeland Security. Among this group are some, some names that we should all recognize, I guess. Uh, Alfred Clifford of Clifford Algebras, Marshall Hall, the group theorist, and Andrew Gleason, an MIT mathematician. They and several of the others went back to academic work after World War II, but seemed to maintain a relationship with successor agencies. Um, a number of them went back to serve as code breakers during the Korean War. But they often worked on SCAMP and other summer projects for NSA. Some of the mathematicians actually stayed on with NSA. Howard Campaign had been teaching at the University of Minnesota prior to the war and stayed on and became director of research for NSA. Howard Angstrom was at Yale prior to the war. He later was vice president of Remington Rand and became deputy director of NSA. Reed Dawson was an NSA statistician. William Blankenship 
uh, went to NSA and became one of their first programmers, developed some of the ideas of computer programming. William Ray, he's in the front row. He, he was not eligible for commission because he had polio as a child. He stayed on with NSA as a statistician, later became deputy director of production, and seemed to be involved in signals intelligence during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And J.J. Ickes, um, he's known as the father of the mainframe at NSA, later went on to work at Honeywell. Yes? Thing yes, right. Now, the other part of the story is in Dayton, Ohio. Now, Northern Kentucky University is just across the river from downtown Cincinnati, and Dayton is just on the north side of Cincinnati, so they're, they're our neighbors. The mathematicians at, in D.C. came up with the ideas for the code-breaking machines, and then National Cash Register in Dayton actually engineered and produced the machines. Um, the Naval Computing Machine Laboratory was on a site at NCR. A lot of waves were brought into Dayton to help produce the machines. A few naval officers were there. Ralph Meter was the commander there. He was from Bureau of Ships. And the person who directed it for um, NCR is Joseph Desch. Desch was an electrical engineer. His experience was in developing techniques to do electronic counting. NCR was had produced cash registers, at that time they were mostly driven by gears. The desire was to be able to switch this over so they could count electronically. And that was Desh's experience. It was thought that would be useful to, break, to build code breaking machines. Uh, Desh was inducted into the NSA Hall of Honor last year for his work producing machines for the Navy. The first machines that were produced were to attack the Enigma cipher, the German Enigma cipher. Just like the military campaigns, the cryptological effort was Europe first. The British had built upon the work of Polish mathematicians who had first broken Enigma prior to the attack on Poland. Um, the Poles had constructed a machine which they called a cryptologic bomb to break Enigma. The mathematicians at Bletchley Park constructed a similar machine, or a machine to do this a similar work, uh, logically, it was different, but they kept the name of bomb. During 1941, typically the British could break German Enigma messages. And they were able to read the messages to the U-boats and route convoys around where the wolf packs were. In 1942, Admiral Dernitz, who was the commander of the U-boats, had become concerned about the security of Enigma messages. Enigma had a three-rotor scrambler on it, and he had a fourth rotor added to the U-boat's Enigmas. Uh, the cipher was called Shark, and the British were blacked out. So beginning in 1942, the Battle of the Atlantic turned away from the Allies, and the convoys were being hit very heavily by the U-boats. The British responded by trying to add a fourth rotor to their cryptologic bombs. The problem was that it wasn't fast enough. And they didn't have the technology available, or the technological capacity available to build new four-rotor bombs. So after some lengthy negotiations, the responsibility for breaking shark, U-boat Enigma, was turned over to the United States Navy. The machines were, were designed by the mathematicians in DC based upon the work of the British and they were engineered and built at NCR in Dayton. Now this is a picture of one of the machines. A remaining machine is on display at the National Cryptologic Museum just outside of Fort Meade. NCR got the contract in July 1942, and by December 1943, they had built 103 bombs. And they were at work in the Naval Communications Annex in DC. By that time, the tide had turned in the Battle of the Atlantic. And naval codebreakers were able to spend more time looking at Japanese ciphers. Now, that doesn't mean that they had ignored them prior to that. Um, JN-25 was a primary Japanese naval cipher. It was being attacked by codebreakers at Station Cast in the Philippines. It was also being attacked 
by the code breakers in Washington, D.C., but Joe Rokesford's code breakers at Station Hypo in Honolulu were given a different task. They were asked to break a flag officer's cipher. And there were so few messages that they didn't have enough to work with to be able to break the cipher. However, by the time of the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, or after the attack on Pearl Harbor, Rochefort's group then was also given the task of working on JM-25. They actually began to get into it fairly, fairly quickly. A bit of information was gathered which affected the battles, Battle of Coral Sea, um, in which, for the first time, the Japanese spread into the South Pacific was stalled. The Rochefort's most significant um, success was gathering very detailed information on a planned Japanese attack on Midway. The information he provided to Admiral Nimitz allowed Nimitz to station his carriers in an ambush for the Japanese carriers that were attacking Midway, and all four of the Japanese carriers were sunk. And in 1943, JN-25 information was responsible for the shootdown of a plane carrying um, Admiral Yamamoto. But as 1943, or we got to the end of 1943, uh, Lieutenant Lawrence Steinhardt, one of the Navy mathematicians, was given the task of building machines or designing machines to break the Japanese additive ciphers. JN-25 was the primary one. We'll also mention JN-11. Now, JN-25 was based upon a five-digit code. Common Japanese words and phrases were replaced by five-digit numbers. Now, codes are typically broken by linguists, people who understand the structure and patterns of languages. To make the code more secure, the Japanese overlaid it with random additives. So, for example, a code group like full stop 50418 would have an additive overlaid on it, and the overlaying was done by a false sum. 8 plus 8 was 6. You did, no, you did no carrying. So essentially, you're adding vertically mod 10. So you get 6, 6, 7, 5, and 5 plus 6 is 1, not 11. And what was transmitted then would be the false sum. When that, when that was obtained by the receiving operator, he would subtract the additive. Now again, it's a false subtraction. So here, it's 8 from 6 is mod 10 get back 50418, which is the underlying code group, look it up in the code book, and recover the message. So this is the beginning of the JN25 message. The Japanese sender would, again, take all the words and phrases and replace them by five-digit numbers. That would be done by going to the code book. And then there was an additional book of random numbers, table of additives. I think I took this from um, Peter Donovan's Cryptologia article on uh, JN25. The sending operator would pick a place to start the additives. Uh, I'm going to pick row 66, column 52, and start my additives there. Now, we notice that the rows and columns are not numbered in order, nor were the pages. And this is the code group. Here's the additive we selected. We fault sum to get the transmitted group. And then subsequent additives were added, false sum to subsequent code groups. And this is what is transmitted. Now, of course, when it gets to the other end, the receiving operator has to have some idea where the additives came from. So there was typically an indicator system built into this process. This is a common way to do it. On top, the indicator is 638 is the page number, 66 is the row number, and 52 is the column number. And usually what would happen is that information would be buried away in some specific location in the message, often quite early in the message. So I'm going to say blocks 3 and 4. So if I'm going to use blocks 3 and 4 as indicators, then block 3 would consist of 63866, and block 4 would be 52 and then three digits of jump. And that would allow the receiving operator to know where to start the string of additives. Now, it was important in breaking JN25 and these other additive ciphers 
to try to first break the indicator system because that provided a lot of information for the code breakers. Now, this is a very simple one. There are five messages here. Uh, it's pretty easy to spot that the indicator is that first block. All the other numbers are look pretty much random. Each of these has 003 as the first three digits. That's the page number. The fourth digit is the row number. These are all from row zero, which I'm assuming is the top row. And these are the column numbers. Now what that means is, having broken the indicator system, the code breakers can align the messages vertically, align them in depth, so that each of these columns has been encrypted using the same additive. Now, it was likely that this would happen, that messages would be accumulated in depth. Japanese forces were spread throughout the South Pacific. Thousands of messages were sent each day. It was not unusual to gather more than a thousand messages in a day. And in that many messages, it's very likely that the, um, the additive strings will overlap some. So it was not unusual to obtain depth in messages. But once the messages were put in depth, then a technique called differencing was used. If you go to a column and you pull out two transmitted groups, then what one of them is an underlying code group plus additive. The other is another underlying code group plus the same additive. And when you do the subtraction on those, you wipe out the additive. What you're left with, of course, is the difference of two code groups. As the code breakers accumulated more and more of these code groups, after breaking more and more messages, what they did is take the most frequent ones, typically several hundred of them, and they differenced all of them. And there was a table of differences. <coughs> so having grabbed two code, transmitted code groups, doing the subtraction, they would look at the difference, go to a difference table, and see if it appeared there. And if it did, they had the possibility of determining what those two code groups came, or what were the two code groups it came from. When the mathematicians in DC began looking at these problems of the additive, um, Japanese additive ciphers, they, faced, they decided to work on two problems. One was to align messages in depth. And this is particularly important when you haven't broken the indicator system. So you can't, uh, you can't do it based on the indicator system. The second was to, after you've recovered enough code groups, you also recover additives. And it's possible that you might be able to align recovered additives against messages. So the two problems they were trying to solve with these machines were aligning messages in depth and aligning additives against messages. Copperhead won, and all the machines involving the Japanese ciphers were named after snakes for some reason. Copperhead one was designed to align messages in depth. Now I've not done much with this one. But the idea is an old one, uh, goes back to probably William Friedman, that if you align messages in such a way, or if you align them correctly, so they're aligned in depth, you're more likely to have repetition top and bottom than if they're aligned randomly. And we notice in these messages that we have a code group up here, transmitted groups 06511, and the same one down there. And if I align these this way, I also notice that I get a repeat over here. If that happened, then that was a potential correct alignment of the two messages. Yeah. Now, again, it, it's, not a, it's unusual that that sort of thing happens, but it did happen. Um, messages used common phrases, and they repeated additives. So it, this sort of thing did happen where you got the double repeats. In October 1944, this is actually just before Copperhead 1 went into use, uh, there was a memorandum from the mathematicians discussing how likely it was that these things would happen by chance. It's really simple um, mathematics. We'll just walk through a bit of it. It's amazing what you can classify. No, I mean, this, this is actually really quite simple mathematics, but got classified secret at the time. Um, I'm thinking here of two messages. 
and I've taken five blocks out of each message. So each of these you might think of as a five-digit block, so a five-digit block for each of those guys. And I'm starting them out of alignment, and what I want to do is count the number of ways that I can get double repeats. Now, of course, if they're not in alignment, there's no possibility that happens. And if only one of these guys, if, if they only overlap by one, there's no possibility it happens. If they overlap by two, then I could have a repeat here and here, so there's one possibility. If they overlap by three, then one and two could be repeats, one and three could be repeats, two and three could be repeats, there are three ways. If they overlap by four, we get six ways. If they overlap completely, which here means overlap by five, we get ten ways. And then they pull back out on the other side. So overlap of four there, three here, two, and one, and so forth. So what they noticed is that if the overlap is t, the number of places where you can get repeats is t times t minus 1 over 2. And then they assumed, and they often made assumptions on these, um, rather than go through all the theoretical details, they assumed here that the lengths of the two messages were the same, that they were L. And counting the number of places, they started with overlap of 1 up to L, and then back down to 1 again. So everything appeared, the overlaps appeared twice except for the maximal overlap that appeared once. So they ended up with this being their count. They assumed the message of 100 groups, and they came up with 328,350 positions for the double repeats. Then they assumed a situation in which they had received 1,000 messages, each of length 100. And they were going to run each message against each other, against every other message. And they wanted to know how many times by chance they would get the double repeat. So how many times would they, these messages appear to be lined up correctly even though they weren't? And it turns out 16.4. It's not a bad calculation. Uh, so running a thousand messages against one another, 100 groups long, uh, the background noise is only like 16.4 um, positions that we have to check. We don't have to check hundreds of these guys. Yeah. And that, that's easy enough to do. So Copperhead 1 was designed to align these messages in depth. Um, the proposal for the machine was submitted in November 1943, middle of the month. It was approved at the beginning of December, and the first machine was shipped to the Naval Communications Annex in November 1944. Five of them were produced, a little bit more than five actually. There were two pieces to the machine. There was a punch in which the messages were recorded. And then there were scanners on which the messages were run against them. There seems to be something interesting going on just before the machines arrived in D.C., though. In August of 1944, Howard Angstrom, who was the director of the mathematicians, the GM section at Op 20 G, uh, wrote to Dayton and said that he needed copper, or they needed Copperhead 1 to be able to handle four-digit systems. Now, JN25 was a five-digit system, but JN11 was a very similar system, but was four digits. It was used by the Merchant Marine, and therefore by convoys. Dayton replied back immediately that they'll just provide a switch to change from four to five digits. Now today that might be just a few lines of code. I mean, here they've got a machine built. It's got gears, it's hardwired, it's got electronic stuff. It didn't happen quite as quickly as they thought. Um, 25th of September, Angstrom is saying they need it as soon as possible. It's not clear exactly why, but they need it as soon as possible. And in 14th of October, they're still trying to apparently fix the four-digit problem or solve the four-digit problem. Now, I mentioned Joe Desch. His daughter, Debbie Anderson, still lives in Dayton. And she related the story of her father's, um, he had a breakdown about this time. Apparently from the stress of working on the code-breaking machines, and he also told her that he was working on solving a problem having to do with Japanese ciphers. He spent 48 hours working continuously on the problem, and he solved it. 
And he also felt some responsibility for the deaths that occurred because of it. Now, she's been looking at the documents, and his name seems to no longer appear in documents toward the end of October. So we're thinking that that's the time at which he had this breakdown. Just, just before that were the battles of the Leyte Gulf. And this is where the kamikaze attacks were first used against the US Navy. About the middle of November, well, back here, beginning of November, the first copper hit shows up in DC. Middle of November, a convoy is attacked. The US Navy submarines lay in ambush for a convoy of troop ships. They torpedo the troop ships and kill approximately 7,000 men. And there's, there's a belief by some that this is what was responsible for, for Deshi's breakdown. That he solved the problem of switching from five digit to four digit cipher. And that led to a successful attack on the, uh, on the Japanese convoys. Copperhead 2 was to assign, to do the other problem. Assuming you've got a message and you recovered some additives, try to line up additives against message. Now, the idea was to take the, add, take the message, line up the additives, subtract, move to a new position, line up the additives and subtract. Something like this, here's the transmitted message. Here's a string of additives, it's not complete, we haven't recovered all of them. Here's a subtraction. Apparently the test case was going to be how many high frequency code groups appeared after you stripped the additives off. But then it turned out that from the very beginning it was a low priority. And I guess that makes sense because recovering additives is not one of the first things that happens when you break codes. That's, that's later in the process. Um, in November 1944, when Copperhead 1 is now in use, Copperhead 2 project is terminated, and there's a comment in the memorandum saying essentially nothing has been done on this, and we might as well just go ahead and terminate it. Copperheads 3 and 4, no clue. Uh, there, was, there was a proposal for Copperhead 5, so we assume that there was a 3 and a 4, but they don't appear anywhere in any of the documents we've seen, nor have any other people I've talked to who have worked in this area known anything about three and four. So, no clue on three and four. But Copperhead 5. Copperhead 5 was specifically designed for JN25. Now, Copperhead 1 and Copperhead 2, those could work against any additive cipher, five-digit, four-digit additive cipher. It depended on no properties of JN25. But Copperhead 5 did use a property of JN25. Because of the unreliability of radio transmission, Japanese built error detection into JN25. These are underlying code groups. And it turns out that the error detection was that every underlying code group was divisible by three. Now, this sort of works at cross purposes from the encryption. Encryption is trying to remove patterns. It's trying to make things look random. But error detection requires either that you repeat information or you create a pattern. And these are working against one another. And it allowed the Navy code breakers a better shot at breaking JN25. And it doesn't seem to have helped the Japanese, right? I mean, so I guess the idea was you'd strip the additive off, and then you take the group and you divide by three and see if it was divisible by three. If it wasn't, you knew you had a garble. But on the other hand, if you look in the code book and it's not there, you know you have a garble. Um, unless you're really good at arithmetic, you'd probably rather look in the code book. So it doesn't seem that it really helped them, but it did help the Navy code breakers. So what they noted was, if you add together all of the digits of the code group, it's got to be divisible by three. So the group divisible by three means the same as some of the digits divisible by three. So it could be as small as zero for the sum from the code group 0000, or it could be as large as 45 from the code group 99999. And these are the other possibilities. But the frequencies are not uniform. And that's exactly the sort of thing that allows you into such a system. Now, for the most part, they didn't actually use the sum of the digits. They used the sum of the digits mod 10. 
which didn't distinguish quite as well, but still distinguished well enough for them to be able to get into JN25. They came up with two systems of weights. The first thing, again, that we were trying to do was align messages in depth. The first were developed by Marshall Hall. Uh, these are something that I'm working on with a student right now, Jared Atropos, and we're trying to reconstruct Hall's weights. The scheme that's described, it turned up very recently in the archives, I found a table of Hall's weights in a couple paragraphs describing how they were supposed to have been uh, constructed. How they were constructed is essentially the same way they were used. Uh, these are two, code, uh, two transmitted groups. What they did was, assuming these are in depth, they subtracted them. They subtracted them both ways. Then, instead of using these numbers, they rearranged the digits left to right, smallest to largest. And they picked the smaller of the two. And they increased that weight by one. And they went through all the code groups all the valid code groups, all the numbers divisible by three. They, they did the subtractions. They did the subtractions both ways, rearranged the digits, counted the number of times these guys occurred. They got the frequencies. They threw away the last two digits and saved the three most significant ones as the weight. That's the way they describe it. Now, when we repeated that, we don't get quite the same weights. So we're, we're still working on trying to resolve that. But that was those were the weights that um, Marshall Hall uh, had designed for breaking JN25. Now, one of the joys of working with this has been to at least at a distance have met, having met uh, Edward Simpson. Simpson is a British statistician. Simpson's paradox is named after him. In 1943, he worked at Bletchley Park as a code breaker in Hut 7, and he attacked JN25. At that same time, Marshall Hall was visiting there. So he worked with Hall. At the end of the war, Simpson and a colleague wrote a history of breaking JN25. Unfortunately, it's still classified by GCHQ. And he's 93 years old now, and he said he cannot remember the details of what they did. But as we ask him questions or provide him additional information, he's able to recall more and he's been working with us at a distance to try to recover how these Hall's weights were used. Now, the Bletchley Park code breakers were definitely using Bayesian techniques for their code breaking. There's no evidence so far that the US Navy code breakers were using Bayesian techniques on the Japanese side. They certainly did on Enigma, but we don't see them yet on, on the Japanese side. The other set of weights was actually the one that was used we called Shin Weights. It's a Lieutenant Shin who was a um, Navy code breaker. And instead of working with the actual transmitted groups, what they did was took the sum of the digits of the groups, mod 10, and worked with the single digits. This is a difference table ba based on sum of digits, mod 10. And this is the distribution of the numbers in that table based upon that distribution we saw earlier. What the Shin weights did was take those differences, 0 through 9, and notice that 1 and 9 have the same weight, 2 and 8, 3 and 4, so there's a symmetry there. And they scaled them in such a way that the Shin weights had this, essentially the same mean as Hall's weights. They would take two transmitted code groups, sum the digits mod 10, take the difference, well, we can say both ways, but they're complementary, so it doesn't really matter here, and then assign a weight. Copperhead 5 used that to align JN25 messages in depth. Here are two messages. Each transmitted group is replaced by sum of digits mod 10. The difference is obtained. The weight is assigned to the difference. The weights are summed. They're averaged over the overlap. If you meet a certain threshold, the assumption is that they are in depth. Copyright 5 was never produced. 
Uh, apparently, we got to the point prior to production that the Japanese dropped the error detection properties of JN25, so it was no longer useful for them. But there's another snake machine, Mamba, and this was to solve the other problem. Given the message, given some recovered additives, try to align the additives up against the message. It also used some of digits mod 10. Now this is the distribution we saw earlier. It did the same thing for the additives. What it did was take an additive, or take an additive, sum the digits mod 10. If the additive sum was zero, then it was most likely that when you added to a code group, you would end up with a 1, 4, 7, or 8. It was least likely to get a 2, 3, 6, or 9. If the additive sum was 1, then it was most likely, when added to a code group, you get 0, 3, 6, or 7. Least likely to get to 1, 2, 5, or 8. Transmitted groups were replaced by sums mod 10 in message. Additives replaced by sums mod 10. Now, actually, when the additive was punched, in addition to the additive, the most likely sums was punched and the least likely sums was punched, a max and a min. And what Mamba did was compare the transmitted groups to maxes and mins. So in this case, there are three maxes and one min. They had a detector which looked at max minus min, and there was a threshold set. And again, we're trying to understand the threshold. They decided that a linear threshold was good enough. Uh, a is a constant. It's allowed to be between 0.1 and 0.5. Z is the number of groups overlap. And C is a constant between 0 and 10. And this was set on the machine. And it would register a hit every time max minus min exceeded that threshold. Now, Jared was running some distributions the other day, so I, I grabbed some of his pictures. Uh, these are for various overlaps, overlaps of 45, 50, and so forth. The distribution on the left is the distribution we get of max minus min, assuming random, that things are not aligned properly. And the distribution on the right is max minus min if the alignment is correct. And we can see over here, when the alignment is around 60 in overlap, that the, the mean of the correct alignment is more than three standard deviations away from the mean of the incorrect alignment, which at least gives us enough evidence to believe the machine should have worked. We should have been able to distinguish between correct alignment and incorrect alignment. In May 1944, there was a recommended, it was recommended that two Mambas be built. We can see along the way that um, JN25 is no longer a priority. Again, JN25 dropped their error detection along the way. In November of 44, um, Mamba apparently still had not been produced. Acme Pattern and Tool in Dayton, Ohio was working on it. NCR was, was just sort of filled up with work. But one was produced, not two. In the archives, this is a picture labeled Mamba. There's no clue as to what Mamba is in the picture. But based on the documents, we think Mamba is this machine with perhaps some of the stuff here. This may be input and output. Now, someone was asking whether it's the one on the table. I think we can agree that it's not the machine on the table. Just an adding machine stuck there. But there was one Mamba machine for this. When the contract went to uh, NCR, remember that was in 1942, and the first production was to get cryptologic bombs to break Enigma. The beginning in December 43, they started to produce machines, still working on German ciphers, but then the machines also to attack the Japanese ciphers, and there are lots of machines. Every cipher generated a new machine. So. In, a, in one of the Mamba letters, and this is by Lieutenant Howard, he points out 
It's believed that thought should be given to the desirability of building equipment of general usefulness, which might do this, and he's referring to the Mamba job there, and other jobs rather than a number of machines each designed to meet a specific need. Uh, they're getting fed up building machines, apparently. They would like a universal machine that can be used for all of these purposes. And he goes on to say, the thought's advanced because it's felt that we should be building for the future, wherein machines built for specific purposes may become obsolete, but the value of a more generally universal machine might become enhanced. And they really want something that's equivalent to today's computers. Right? They don't want to build a machine for each cipher. They want to take a machine that will do all of them and just modify them. Well, at the end of the war, um, Joseph Wenger, who was the deputy director of Op20G, later became a rear admiral and a vice director at NSA, did not want to lose the talent that had been developed in naval communications. And he wanted to continue building code-breaking machines and, in general, building something that today we would call a computer. They wanted to keep the Naval Computing Machine Laboratory operating. Now, the first choice was to leave it at Dayton. Uh, it turned out NCR didn't want it. They wanted to get back to making the cash registers, which ultimately was a bad choice because later they had to buy a computer company to, to get back into the computer business. But during the war, NCR, to their credit, had made no money on the Naval contracts. They did everything at cost. So when the war was over, they wanted to get back into the business of making some money. And they said no, they weren't interested in keeping it. Howard Angstrom and William Norris from Communications uh, Security Annex in Washington got together with John Parker, a businessman from um, St. Paul, Minnesota, and they formed Engineering Research Associates to continue the work. And they're essentially an exclusive contract with the Navy. Now, in the early 1950s, uh, Congress became aware of that, and there was some concern that the Navy had taken some former officers, established them in the company, and started feeding them contracts. So, uh, Engineering Research Associates reorganized into Remington Rand. One of their first projects, it was called Task 13, apparently because if you use the word computer, you had to involve the uh, National Bureau of Standards in the contract, uh, was to build a computer for the Navy for code breaking. They built some other code breaking machines prior to this, apparently, but their first was called Atlas. And then, then it went on the commercial market as uh, ERA 1101. When Remington Rand was later purchased by Sperry, and this was all this work was pushed off in the UNIVAC division, it became the UNIVAC 1101. And the 1101, you would recognize, is the binary for 13. I think a strong argument can be made that the computing industry developed out of the needs of the code breakers, and particularly in the United States, out of the need of the naval code breakers. Similar experience at Bletchley Park in, in Britain. This is a picture of Colossus. Now, it was designed to break teletype, German teletype ciphers. It was designed sort of as a single purpose machine, but in fact, it had the capabilities of, of doing digital computing. It was secret, so it wasn't until years after that the, the existence of the machine was, was revealed. But, the naval code breakers here and the code breakers at Bletchley Park needed machines to test logic. They would set up logical conditions and they were testing logical conditions. Now the other half of the story sort of comes from the Army point of view, I guess, the ENIAC, which is the more famous of the early computers, which was designed for rapid calculation, generating artillery tables and working on calculations for the atomic bomb. Of course, today's computers merge both of those capabilities, the rapid calculation and the test for logic. But it seems that it's, it's, it was the needs of the code breakers that developed the idea that you had to have these universal machines that tested logical conditions. 
I guess that's it. Bye.